The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Typebond. Have I got a treat for you guys today. I know that you love it when I put myself in uncomfortable positions, maybe techniques I've never done before or materials I've never used before. Uh, well, this project was one that I really tried to increase the difficulty level. Now, the story is my mom needed a tall, skinny pantry to go in a very specific spot in her house. She had very specific needs for what each compartment would do and then said, can you build something? I wasn't really that enthused about it, so I wanted to make the project more interesting by adding some veneering challenges, some grain matching challenges, and it turned into a, just a hell of a project. It took a lot of time, uh, and my butt was dragging by the end of it, to be honest. But here's the final result. Let me give you the quick tour. This project has walnut for days, featuring quarter sawn Queensland walnut veneered panels and black walnut rails and styles. I spent a lot of time and effort to make the grain align throughout this piece, and by the end of it, I kind of hated myself. The top compartment is a basic cabinet with a single adjustable shelf and small magnets were used to hold the doors closed. The top two drawers are for utensils or other crap that my mom needs to store in there. The next drawer is for bread and baked goods. And the bottom drawer is actually two compartments for onions and potatoes. Before anyone tells me that we shouldn't store onions next to potatoes because the onion farts will cause the potatoes to spoil faster, we already know. Settle down, it's fine. Now the pools are made of Macassar ebony. If you look closely, you'll notice that any adjacent rails were actually cut from the same board to also maintain grain continuity there. And you may also notice that the doors have no styles, even though they have plenty of style. So sit back, enjoy my pain and discomfort as I try to keep all the grain aligned and everything looking perfect. Here we go. We'll start by cutting the half inch plywood that we'll use for the core of the veneered panels, as well as some solid walnut for the edge banding. What's different here is I'm attaching the edge banding before I apply the veneer. This will help give the panels the appearance of solid wood as the veneer runs continuously from side to side. So this means I need to be pretty strategic about how I prep my panel cores. Now let's play with some veneer. The veneer comes in a stack called a flitch. Basically, they're all slices from the same board kept in order. While not perfect copies, the sheets should all look pretty similar. So I take enough veneer sheets to account for the inside and the outside of my panels. I then cut out the most attractive section that will cover all of my doors and drawers top to bottom. The stack is then bundled together and placed between two sacrificial plywood boards so we can put a nice edge on the veneer. I'll secure the ends with some screws and then pinch the middle with a couple of clamps. The fragile veneer actually becomes quite durable when it's secured this way in a stack. And it's durable enough to run over the jointer just to clean up that edge. With the bundle still together, I run the stack through the table saw to trim the other overhanging side. And then I could take a quick pass at the joiner to clean up that edge as well. Now I'll bring my door and drawer panels together to help me determine where I need to make the cuts in the veneer stack so that I've got one section for the top doors and then one for the bottom drawers. To make the cut, I'll use the miter saw with a lot of clamps and a big call. At this point, it's crucial to begin labeling the veneer so that we don't get the pieces confused. On continuous grain projects, it is remarkably easy to get turned around only to realize that something is misaligned after it's too late. To make these three sheets act as one, we'll essentially stitch the veneer together with veneer tape. The process begins by stretching blue tape across the joints on the glue face. Now these are just temporary. I then flip the sheet and begin stitching the joints with veneer tape. This tape is super thin and has moisture activated adhesive on one side. It's a lot like a stamp, though I don't recommend using your tongue or someone else's. Instead, run the strips across a wet sponge. The tape is placed over each joint. As the tape dries, it shrinks slightly and holds the joint closed nicely. That's when we could remove the blue tape from the other side. Now this sweet rig is a vacuum press consisting of a platen with air grooves, a polyurethane bag, and a vacuum pump. We'll get back to the press once our veneer sandwich is ready. I'm using a water-based glue, so I'm trying to work as fast as possible here. A small paint roller is a real big help. 
The veneer sandwich consists of two calls on the outside followed by veneer sheets and the core at the center. The whole package goes into the vacuum bag and the bag is sealed. The vac goes sucky sucky and atmospheric pressure now works its magic. I leave the panel under pressure overnight. The next day, I open it up to see what we have. As long as there are no bubbles or flaws, this panel can be set aside until we're ready to slice it up into separate doors, which is not yet. By the way, check out that edge. The veneer goes right up to the edge, and you really don't see the edging material from the front. This helps reinforce the illusion of a solid panel, even though it's veneer. The whole process is repeated for the second panel. Now even though our panels are dry, the glue really isn't fully cured and there's still moisture in the panel. So to help prevent warping, I'll sticker and stack the panels with a little bit of weight on top. Go Rockler! Next is the door and drawer rails. These are a little trickier now since every place that we have two rails meeting, I'm going to try to cut those from the same board. Now you can kind of see what we're going for here with the rails that'll join with the panels once everything is cut up. I carefully cut the drawer panel down into the individual drawer fronts. Sorry stick, boom, 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 boom. Now I won't separate the door panel into two until I get the rails glued on. This way, the grain will be perfectly continuous on not only the panels, but the rails too. So the sides of the cabinet will be frame and panel construction. I'll begin cutting the material for that, including the quarter inch core and the veneer. Believe it or not, the side panels will also be continuous grain, top to bottom. Of course, the side frames will be made from solid walnut. The long styles need a groove for the panel, so I'll cut them at the table saw. The way I've got my dado stack set up leaves a little sliver of material in the middle, which you can knock out with a chisel or a cool tool like this router plane. The rails that go between the panels also get a groove. The rear style needs a rabbit for our back panel. Much easier to cut that now than to do it after the sides are assembled. Each rail needs a couple of stubby tenons. Now we can assemble the sides. You can really see what we're going for here with that continuous run of veneer from top to bottom. Yowza! Alright, so now I'll cut the drawer fronts to final size. And I can also split the door panel into two doors. If you were confused before as to why my panels had solid wood strips in the middle, this is why. When I rip these doors down, I'm going right through that solid wood strip, ensuring that we have that veneer all the way to the edge, and the edge is solid wood instead of plywood. See, there's a method to my madness. Part of the strength of the case comes from the dividers, also known as web frames or dust frames. They also subdivide the case into various compartments. We'll make those from solid wood and domino them together. The top and bottom are plywood panels with solid miter trim. I also trim out a third panel that'll be the bottom of the upper door compartment. The trim is then flushed to the panel. Be super careful when you do stuff like this because it's all too easy to burn through the plywood veneer. All right, so back to our side panels. We can now carefully check the sizes of our drawer fronts and doors using relative dimensioning. I no longer care about the numbers, I just care if it fits. I'll use shims to represent the 1 16th inch gaps that I want, and I'll work my way from the bottom to the top. The overhang tells me that I need to remove a small amount of material from each drawer until the stack sits just where I want it. Now it actually took me a few rounds of this process to dial it in, but this is the final result. 
where two drawers meet represents the location of the web frames, so I'll place marks where appropriate on the side frame. I'll use a fence to position the domino and a story stick to mark the locations of each mortise. I could then use an additional piece of stock as a second fence for the next position. So why am I going through this trouble with these fences? Well, one reason is that I need the support for the domino, but even more important is because I need to do all of this again on the other side. So it's nice to know that I'm putting the domino mortises in exactly the right location. The top and bottom web frames are a little bit easier to install since those are just referenced from the top and bottom of the side frames. I'll do a dry assembly just to see what's up. While I often say that the domino is woodworking in easy mode, you can easily get yourself in trouble if you don't plan ahead for repeatability. Now, although it's not glued, it's still secure enough to put it on the ground so that I can kind of take stock of what I've done so far. Looks all right. Now I need to know exactly where to install my drawer slides, and I'll get that info from the drawer fronts. If I know where my fronts sit in relation to my future drawer boxes, I can make the marks and measurements that allow me to construct a set of spacers, which I failed to film, but you'll see them in use later. So now we need to make some drawer boxes. I cut my rabbits in the drawer sides, and then cut the fronts and backs to their final length based on the fit that I see in the actual case. Of course, each drawer needs a bottom, so we'll cut a groove and then cut some quarter inch stock for the bottom panels. Glue up time! I'll reinforce the rabbits with uh, some 18 gauge brad nails. Next, the lower drawer front needs some extra work, including openings for ventilation. The screen I chose brings me back to my Catholic upbringing. Those who know, know. To cut those holes, I'll make a template out of quarter inch plywood, and we'll use that in a minute. At the drill press, I hog out the bulk of the material with a Forstner bit. If you've never had the thrill of drilling holes in a drawer front that has this much time invested in it, you truly haven't lived. Now I'll secure the template to the drawer front and use a router with a flush trim bit to get the final shape with nice clean edges. Before moving the template, I take advantage of the square corners on the template to make the routed corners nice and square. And we'll do the same thing for the other square hole. To cover the plywood edges inside that opening, I'll use some 16th inch thick walnut. In order for the ventilation to work, the drawer box behind the front also needs to have openings. I'll make them slightly larger so that they aren't visually obvious from the front. Now I'm a little bit less concerned about these being perfect, so I'll rough out the opening with a jigsaw. Using a rabbit bit, I'll create a tiny rabbit for the screen material, which we'll cut to size with some snips. To keep the screens in place, I'll use epoxy. And to apply some pressure, I'll use Epiphanes. The back of the bottom drawer now gets some slots routed into it once again to aid in ventilation. This is where the potatoes and onions go, so that's the whole reason for all of this ventilation crap. Now the trim is dry on the drawer front, so we'll sand that flush and ease the edges. And now the epoxy is dry on the screens, so let's see how that turned out. That's A-OK. -okay. Finally, we can assemble the bottom drawer. So remember the doors? Well, they need hinges. I'll mark the hinge locations in the case and scribe them with a knife. Then I'll use a router and chisel to make the mortise. After the case mortises are complete, I can bring the door back to transfer the mortise locations to the door. The door doesn't have a lot of support for routing, so I'll have to add some. Now we can start gluing up the case.
You know, on some glue-ups, I'm comfortable just going for it, but on others, I really like to take my time. And that's what I'm doing here. Each divider goes in one at a time, using squares to keep everything as close to perfect as possible. And once those are all secure and the glue is dry, I can attach the other side. Because these tenons all have to be installed at once, I am using epoxy this time for some extra working time. For the back panel, we'll be using quarter inch walnut ply, but we won't glue it in just yet. Keeping it open will help us with the drawer front installation later. The whole cabinet sits on top of a small base consisting of four feet and four rails. Once again, domino joinery. I've got to tell you, with a piece as demanding as this one, I admit that it's really nice to be able to shut my brain off regarding some of the joinery. That frees me up to focus on the design details and new techniques that I'm trying to employ. Each foot gets a taper using the taper maker. You can actually build one of these for yourself. We've got plans and a hardware kit at TWWstore.com if you're interested. And now for the glue up. The bottom panel is then attached to the base using glue. Ready for another rabbit hole? Let's make some custom drawer pulls using some of this beautiful Macassar ebony. I want the top of the pool to be a symmetrical bull nose, so I'll apply the shape to the edge of the board, sand it smooth, and then cut it off at the table saw. The bottom portion of the pool is pretty simple and gets glued to the bull nose. Now one thing to know about ebony is that it's naturally oily. Oftentimes we need to use epoxy or polyurethane glue, and you might even want to wipe the joint down with acetone or alcohol before gluing. But I totally had a brain fart here and was so excited about my nifty pulls that I didn't even think about the glue that I was using. Fortunately, the wood was freshly milled, and one of the other tricks we can use to help us glue oily woods is to make sure that it's freshly planed. So hopefully these will hold up in the long run, just know that I would have been better off using a different glue. Once the glue dries, I cut the pulls to size. Being so close to the blade, this is a good time to use a clamp. Wherever two pulls meet, like in the doors and in the two top drawers, I'm going to mortise them into the panels. For the lower drawers, with standalone pulls, I'll use the smallest size dominoes to install them. And now let's install the drawer slides. I know a lot of you are big fans of undermount slides, but there are two reasons I didn't use them. One is the cost. They're often as much as three times the cost of side mount slides. On a project like this, it's a little bit silly to talk about cost considerations at this point, um, but it is a factor. Second, I only installed undermount slides once in one project. When I'm making a piece of furniture like this that challenges me as much as this one does, messing around with new hardware is not advisable, so maybe next time. Next, I'll install the hinges. Now they came with brass screws, so it's a good idea to pre-cut the threads with a steel screw first. The screws are also slotted, which is a type of screw that just needs to die. And voila, doors installed. To attach the top and bottom, I'll pre-drill, countersink, and drive some screws. To help keep the doors closed, I'll install some magnets in the door and in the case. One thing I haven't shown much is the finishing touches. Obviously, each part gets sanded carefully and profiled, but that shit's boring. Before installing the back panel, I add some ventilation slots. You know, for ventilation. To attach the drawer fronts, I first pre-drill holes through each box, and then I put the box in the case and use spacers to locate the drawer front. With a couple of clamps added, I can drive screws into the drawer front. These open web frames are really coming in handy here since installing the fronts any other way would be a huge pain. 
so I repeat the process with each subsequent drawer. The top drawer won't give me access, so on this one I'm going to use double stick tape. Now this stuff I'm using here is really really thin, it won't cause the drawer to stick out any more than the rest. This allows me to pull the drawer out, add some clamps, and then I can drive the screws. And hopefully for the last time, the doors are installed. As you can tell, a project like this has lots of assembly, disassembly, and reassembly before things are together for the last time. Now let's install that back panel. Installing this last is what allowed me to get those drawer fronts on without too much trouble. The order you do things can have a huge impact on the simplicity of a build. Inside the upper case, we'll add some holes for an adjustable shelf. Just a few. So now I can blow the dust off and apply the hard wax oil finish. This walnut is gonna pop, like something that pops. The inside of the upper case will get finished, but I don't plan on finishing the insides of the drawer compartment. This is primarily due to the fact that bread and veggies will live down there, and an oil finish like this carries a lot of residual stank, and that lasts for a long time. And guess what? Nobody wants stank on their taters! Now I say this all the time, but few woods experience the drastic transformation that walnut does when hit with an oil finish. Gorgeous. Alright, now that the finish is done, all we have to do is deliver it and install it. Now the space is a little bit tight and the lighting's not great in here, but I did want to show you what this thing looks like in the final location here. Uh, you can see it's a little bit tight, right? There's a pantry door over here and it's a very skinny pantry, which is the reason she wanted more storage. So there's just enough clearance for that, as well as a door that goes out to the garage that swings and just misses, right? So it's got to kind of be nestled between these doors, but uh, let's see what's going on in here. Ooh, M&Ms. Now, of course, one of the things we have to be concerned about with a cabinet this high is making it secure. As you pull the drawers out and you have the front loaded weight on this, it could certainly tip. So what I wound up purchasing was one of those anchor sets that's for like TVs, any large cabinets, dressers, that's kind of um, earthquake proof. Uh, and in this case, it's gonna give us a little bit of extra security so that if there's weight on the front here, it's not gonna cause this thing to tip over. I haven't installed it yet, but that's here waiting for me to do the install. Now, if you look very quickly in here, you can see we've got some utensils in both of these guys, just kitchen gadgets and stuff. The bread drawer, baked goods. Ooh, I shouldn't come here when I'm hungry. And down here, of course, the potatoes and the onions are doing quite nicely. Now, I do have to apologize that I don't have plans for this. I just didn't think most people would want to build it. It's so specific for my mom's space and location here. Uh, but if it's something that you want some measurements to get you started, I do have a SketchUp drawing and it's not very good. It's my working drawing, so it's kind of a mess. It's as is. If you want to email me, I'm happy to send it to you, but there is no official plan for this project. So hopefully you enjoyed seeing it go together. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.